Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, sponsored by the National Health Association. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. Today, my special guest is Jeff Palmer. Jeff is a long-term vegan with a lot of experience in, in this lifestyle, also the founder and president of Clean Machine, a uh, company that's devoted to plant-exclusive nutrition fitness. And uh, he has also been involved as a kind of a kind of a vanguard in the vegan bodybuilding movement. And uh, he's just uh, someone who's been doing this for a long time. So I'm so happy to have you here, Jeff. How are you? Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association, the oldest organization in the world, championing the extraordinary benefits of a whole plant food diet and healthy lifestyle, as well as water-only fasting. We believe that health results from healthful living and focus on evidence-based science that promotes the health of you and your loved ones, as well as the health of all animals and the environment. We feature experts from a cross-section of disciplines within the plant nutrition, vegan, psychological, environmental, and animal compassion sectors. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, the NHA's Director of Health Education. Good, my friend. It's uh, always a pleasure. Uh to be with another long timer. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're old timers in this in this kind of movement. And I, let me touch on that because um, I know that for all of us, you know, people get into this for many different reasons. Oftentimes it's either for nutrition or uh, health, or it could be environmental concerns, or it could be for animal rights. So take me back to your motivation and inspiration that got you into this over 30, 35 years ago. Yeah, um, back in 1985, a um, lot of emotional challenges in my life. Uh, I lost my father to uh, alcohol. I lost my mother to multiple sclerosis, and I lost uh, my brother to mental illness. So my family unit, which I was very close with and very dependent on, I was raised in uh, I was blessed to be raised in a high IQ family. My father was a um, professor at the university level. My mom was a child psychologist. And being raised in that and, and in a small town in Florida, I didn't have that kind of dynamic conversations and exchange of ideas and open heartedness with anyone practically outside my family. So when that family unit, when that base of connection uh, crumbled right before my eyes, the world became a, a harder place for me to survive in. Being a highly sensitive person, I didn't even know that that was a thing until <laughs> many, many years later. But uh, how, how, always, old you, how old were you at that point, Jeff? How, well, it was, I, I lost my father when I was uh, three days before my 18th birthday, and that's when it all started to collapse. Um, I, I sank into deep depression with alcohol and drug abuse, and uh, I attempted to take my life because emotionally I couldn't, I couldn't take the pain anymore. It was so great. Um, but I, I met someone who helped me have a breakthrough, it, and it was such an amazing breakthrough. It was so transformational for me. At that very moment when I had that breakthrough, I, all of those dependencies, the drugs, the alcohol, and eating all animal products just fell away like ashes just falling from my body. I didn't have a need for them because I reconnected with a forgiveness for myself. And my experience just reconnected me with everything. This love that I had that I didn't know where to go with, it was, it was incredible. I literally started seeing auras, my whole body was so energetically charged. I was only sleeping a couple hours a night. It was just the most profound experience. It's hard to explain that to someone who's never been through something like that. But for me, I call it a metanoia. My father was Greek. So that's a Greek word meaning a, a total life change, a change at the core level. I viewed the world differently. I was viewing the world as a place where I came here to get something out of this world and I didn't really feel like I fit in. And, and in that experience, I shifted that totally around the other way to say, wait a minute, I have some gifts here to give and that's my power. 
And when I realized that, I felt like I belonged in a world for the first time ever. I never felt like I belonged here. I felt like an alien, to be honest, being a, a compassionate male, a sensitive, caring human being in a world that was surrounded to me looking like takers, uh, you know, everybody out for themselves. So in that transformational experience, I released all that and I felt what was happening with my body. Being hypersensitive to begin with, when I cleaned up my diet and just went completely exclusive plant-based, oh my God, my brain functioned better. I never suffered a day of depression again since 1985, March 15th. I'll never forget that day. It felt like I had a new lease on life. It's, it's not the typical way. I love that we have lots of movies, that we have social media, that we have support groups, that we have meetups, that we have all these tools for people making the change today. But I had nothing. I didn't even know there was a word vegan. <laughs> I just knew I didn't want to hurt animals anymore. It was, it was a change at my heart level saying, I don't, I know what suffering feels like to the point I wanted to end my own life. And when I was released from that, I felt, how can I pay this back? And in meditation, it just said, stop harming others. And nothing could have been more clear and obvious in my entire life. And it felt like I got reacquainted with who I really am. And I got to be myself for the first time. I was like a born again vegan, you know? but it was my natural state. And being involved in science, I was a science, uh, a biopsych major in college and a couple of years deep into it. But I was looking at, wait a minute, there's chemistry going on here that we just have drugs for everything. And I don't want to do drugs. I don't want to tell people to just do another drug. I know because I just quit doing drugs and I felt amazing <laughs> and and changed my diet. And I said, there's there's got to be more to this. So I've spent the last 34 years reading, continuing to read the studies on my own, self-studies because I didn't like the path of the medical community. I didn't like the path of the scientific community making assumptions not based on a personal experience that I had. And now that we have such amazing doctors like yourself that I'm so grateful for that is sharing this new information, we didn't have studies back in 1985 on vegans. They, they weren't there. <laughs> so there was nothing to compare to. There was. So many assumptions made on the standard American diet, assuming that that's base level. We didn't know that there's an optimal living level of health that should be the base level where people can start out if, if they're plant-based. We never had that to compare to in the studies until you know, some of the, more, the later studies that came out was just in the last decade or two. So I'm so grateful for people like you who are bringing this information to the broader public. Well, Jeff, when we go back to 1985 and you had this breakthrough, I mean, it's remarkable that you did so much of that on your own. Were there were there influential people or inspirational people on your path at that time? Or were you really doing this all solo? You know, it was it was. And what were you reading at that time? I mean, there was certain <laughs> literature, but not a lot. No, the, 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 well, I mean, I guess Diet for a New America came out maybe a year or two after that experience right. for me. So that was like, wow, somebody else rocks this, you know, I'm like, <laughs> awesome. Uh, but no, no books. I had not read any books. I'd always been a very contemplative and introspective person. So that part came easy to me. Once I collapsed in on that pain, this pain and anger I actually really had for my father, for him leaving me, for choosing alcohol and not being there when I needed him. I'm going into a world and he's a sensitive, caring, compassionate male. And he was, you know, the person I looked up for, for guidance. And with him gone, I didn't feel like I had anybody to relate what I was experiencing to. So that was a challenge. So I had nobody. I had to go inside. And thankfully, you know, my mother being a, a child psychologist recognized a lot of things and helped guide me back into myself, gave me a journal so I could reflect inward and stuff. But that breakthrough was so powerful. It all happened in one day. 
I quit drinking, smoking, and eating all animal products that day. That's how clear it was to me. Well, you know, even when people have that clarity, as you know, sometimes with the pressures of life and the changes that go on, there still will be a little bit of a roller coaster effect where you may go off and, but you never really did that, is what you're saying. You, you well, had clarity, I, I you mean, had a clarity of purpose where you just kept moving pretty, pretty much in a straight line from that point forward. Is that what happened? I, I so I I knew that I wanted at that point to not take the standard path of life, which is do the typical job, you know, <laughs> work your ass off, stress out, do a bad diet, and end up with six diseases and fourteen medications. I knew I didn't want to go on that path, and I wasn't going on it. At that moment, the transformation was so powerful. I not only committed to being vegan for the rest of my life, I committed to helping others. I was at that point turned my life and from service to self to service to others because that's where I find my joy. You know, later I was uh, working in a vitamin shop and, and a guy came in, had kidney uh, tumors, uh, both kidneys, and was going to get them both removed. He was going to go on dialysis for the rest of his life, which they told him would be about six years of life before he died. I was reading research at the time about IP6 or phytic, phytic acid, an amazing research at high dose levels and how it was curative. It was actually turning off cancer cells and reversing them. And I, I shared the research with him. He contacted the, the supplement company that was producing it. He came back in three months later. Sorry, it's hard for me even just to talk about it. It's so emotional, but his eyes just filled up with water and he ran at me and gave me a bear hug. And he said, thank you for saving my life. But the next sentence he said was even more powerful. He said, my wife and kids want to thank you too. You don't get that experience by just being out there looking out for yourself. To me, that meant everything. And that's what I live for. That's what I want to do. I, I wanted to be a doctor too, but going through college and I saw it all about the drugs and all about allopathic approaches. I was just like, that's not me. That's not who I am. I want to do the preventative part. But back then in 1985, the options I had was to be a dietitian and you know create menus for people in nursing homes. That's just not that wasn't the lifestyle I wanted. So I I dropped out of college and did self-study. I'm like, well screw this. I'll do this on my own. Yeah, I don't have a degree behind my name because of it. And in hindsight, sometimes I wish I did. I would get more people to listen to me. But but it doesn't mean that the quality of the information is any different. And you know that's why I'm here. That's why I do what I do. I, I'm blessed to have found my joy and found a path of purposeful living. Because without it, I probably wouldn't choose to still be here. Well, you know, it's interesting. In a way, it was fortuitous and even more beneficial because a lot of times people don't realize that they're, they, they think about science as being this completely objective endeavor where you know the goal is truth and let the heavens fall, as Dr. Shelton used to call mm -hmm. a speak. The truth of the matter is there are so many biases. And when you speak to people like Colin Campbell and in my own experience, when you start trying to present the truth of this way of thinking and living, it's interesting how science will reject that. A lot of the science articles don't get published, you get rejected for, and people are making biased decisions. So in a way, you were not encumbered by that. So mm. in a way, your self-study allowed kind of a more open path that mm. was actually closer to the truth that oftentimes the so-called objectivity of science is not. And mm. so in a way, that was kind of allowed you to be a lot more clear as you are in your studies and, and personal path. Well, as you got into that, now you're in your mind and in your mindset, you know, a life of service was clearly the road less traveled that, you know, you wanted to take, <laughs> yeah. you know, but uh, so within the context of that, where did the the love and the interest in actual fitness and exercise and activity come in? Because that obviously became a very driving force in your life. And we'll get more and more into that. But how did that play 
on this path that you were now forging for yourself? So when I started sharing my story of transformation, I would generally get one of two broad reactions. Uh, one was, okay, you're a little weird. You're a little out there. That's too much for me. Um, uh, and the other was, oh my God, what an, you should write a book or you should tell people about this. So um, I realized that um, I, I needed, I wanted to find a way that I could connect with people in the mainstream because this is where the problem was lying. This is where all the heart attacks and diseases were happening. But my story was a little bit too much for people to, to embrace or to, to connect with. So I, I traveled all over, I traveled to 48 different countries and I was just immersing myself in different cultures and looking what are the ways they use to gain transformational experiences, to create shifts in their life so they can see things differently and maybe make changes that would allow them to positive. And each culture had their different paths. And in doing, I was I was uh, doing a sweat lodge with a Native American chief and through a whole traditional, the prayer bags and 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 the uh, meditation into the fire, then you know breathing into the rocks and then the whole immersive experience. It was so transformational for me. I said, okay, but wait a minute, what's physically going on? The heat intensely causes an outpouring of sweat. That's a physical, visceral reaction. And then my mind started pouring out. It's like, well, if the body's pouring out, I'm gonna start pouring out some of my mind. And the ideas were just flowing. And then the emotions started pouring up and I got myself into tears and reliving experiences. And I'm like, that's it. Just take one element of the emotional, the spiritual, the psychological, or the physical and move it. And the rest of the human, all because we're a whole being, will want to shift with it in its connectiveness. And I thought, well, okay, well, most people eat <laughs> and they exercise or do some sort of physical activity. And I said, well, start there, because that's something everybody can say. Yeah, I do that. So I said, all right, but if I can teach people. When I was at 24-Hour Fitness, um, they did a study on uh, what's the reason why people stop exercising. Because I wanted to keep people exercising, because it's that consistency that you really gain the benefits, the health benefits out of. Just like being consistent with your diet. And I, the number one reason was I don't get results fast enough. And I'm like, okay, there's something that I can work on. If the vast majority of people are going to the gym and then quitting too quickly, if they stayed in the gym, they'd get better health results. And those better health results, they could build on saying, hey, wait a minute, that feels better. I lost some weight. I'm feeling better. I have more energy. I want to keep doing this. And that's the motivation that they're looking for. Give me a reason why to keep doing this through positive feedback. So I said, well, let me, let me find what nature has to offer that is really nutrient dense or nutrient rich that will help them get results through their exercise and through their nutritional choices that will give them a more profound or more higher experience instead of the slower path of a little bit of exercise, a little bit of change of diet. They're, I think people need a little bit more stronger experience in order to get them excited and motivated. So I said, I'll teach them about the exercise through regular Facebooks and I'll teach them how to, how to actually choose some of these extraordinary plants. So I was finding these amazing studies about these plants, but they're not in our food supply. They're not in our food system. You know, I have 20, 30 different foods that most people eat every day, you know? but it's just that group of foods. And they don't have, you know, tell me a food that we eat every day that is full of adaptogens. There aren't, yet they have extraordinary healing powers, balancing powers for our body. They can heal disease states. They can reverse and balance the body and its hormone levels. So many benefits, but they're not in our food supply. So they're not being exposed to them. And, I, and look, I'm all about getting your nutrition from whole plant foods. I'm a whole food plant guy. But I think there's a place for taking some of these extraordinary plants and making them available to more people so that they can have that experience 
wow, I heal better. I heal faster. I'm getting better results in the gym. Now I want to stay with it. That's my hope. And that's that's the path I'm trying to get the mainstream folks an experience, one that they can relate to that doesn't seem so weird, you know. Uh, and 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 we even look at every year, I'm sure you see Mediterranean diet's been the number one diet. But one of the metrics why they say it's the number one diet is because it's easier to sustain. Plant-based is like down at number 10. It should be number one every year, whole food plant-based, but it's not. Why? Because they said it scores so low on people being able to maintain that diet. It's too foreign for them. It's, it's hard to do in social environments. It's hard to stay on it. And I'm like, okay, well, if we can make this easier for people to make that transition, gain a more pronounced experience, could this help more people make that change? That's my hope. Well, Jeff, let me take a, a few moments of a break. I'm here with Jeff Palmer, founder and CEO of the very plant conscious uh, company called Clean Machine. We're going to take a few seconds of a break to hear from our sponsor, the National Health Association. And now to put a smile on the sponsors of the National Health Association, you're listening to the Health Science Podcast Show. I want to remind you to visit the National Health Association website, where you'll find incredible resources to support your healthy lifestyle, including plant-exclusive eating without added salt, oil, and sugar. Simply go to healthscience.org or nationalhealthassociation.org. Be sure to check out membership, which is $35 per year for those living within the U.S. and $55 for those living outside the U.S. You'll be amazed at all the information and benefits you'll receive. As a member, you're kept up to date on the latest evidence-based tools for health promotion. You'll receive the incomparable quarterly magazine, Health Science, a beautiful 40-page advertising-free publication mailed to your home or offices loaded with articles, recipes, inspirational stories, and interviews with world leaders in the fields of personal health, plant-based nutrition, water-only fasting, animal rights, and environmental support. And you'll receive details about life-changing events, such as the 2023 NHA conference set for June 23 to the 25th, 2023 in Cleveland, Ohio which will be the NHA 75th Annual NHA Conference. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and now back to the show. It's hard to include things that we don't know because we don't know what they are. So mm -hmm. by definition, almost, supplements would be somewhat deficient in relationship to whole foods. What your feeling is, is that by outsourcing a wide variety of plants and foods that contain a wide variety of nutrients and putting them in the kinds of uh, the the kinds of combinations that you create that you are making these things available in more of a whole food form is that what you're feeling in terms of your own mindset correct and and obviously for to to get people compliant the ease of use of of taking a supplement uh, or a powder form can be so much more convenient and useful than, than, I mean, how many people grow ashwagandha? Yet yeah, it's nobody, the, nobody the does. king we, of we adaptogens, yeah. right? And it, it's been used for 3000 years in Ayurvedic medicine. Um, and it has wonderful properties for healing and adapting. And I love about adaptogens, if you're too high in something, it'll bring it down. If you're too low in something, it'll actually increase it. It's a well, here, balancing herb. Here's the problem that I've it's observed. It's not in our food supply, though. Yeah, here's the problem that I've observed clinically, though, because we are a culture that is tied into the quick fix. Yes. Whether it's a dietary approach that's going to promote rapid weight loss, people are not looking many times at the fact that long-standing success has a time factor that you do have to respect. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when you get into the idea that we're going to short-circuit that a little bit in terms of your compliance and success by giving you something that's easier to deal with, um, the question comes up, can they shift the mindset to realize that, yes, I'm supplementing a whole food, a dynamic approach, but there's still going to be some time factor for me to resolve 
problems of weight loss or conditions of disease? And does it really take them closer to the kind of long-term mindset of compliance that really is important? So speak to that for me. What have you observed in the people you work with and how it allows them to move Instead of spending their food dollar, which happens so much for people on supplementation, and we know they need to take their discretionary income and direct it at Whole Foods, mm -hmm. how has your approach helped people make that shift more effectively? Can you talk to that? Can you speak to that just a little bit? Yeah. Well, one, I think people have a misunderstanding of what uh, dietary supplements are. The word supplement means to supplement or add to a whole food plant-based diet. I think where they get that wrong is, is they're they're taking a supplement instead of a whole. Well, they food. interpret and that it I don't as, advocate at all. For. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the supplement industry has fed that idea of substitution rather than supplementation, and yes. that is the problem. So, how do you battle that 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 mindset, that shift that so many people have made, where they believe they can avoid eating the whole food product because now they've got this panacea or this, you know, this short gap attempt to improve nutrition. And of course, we want to latch on to that. Everybody's looking for the quicker way to do things. They're looking for that quicker fix, that instant gratification. So you got to walk a fine line when you're dealing with the idea of supplementation, because it's so easy for people to default into that mindset of, I'm just going to reach for the quick fix. There's no doubt. But, you know, supplementation, like if you uh, are making a pasta sauce, you can add some rosemary and some basil and, right. and, and uh, you know, a little bit of mineral salt. Uh, you know, that's a typical pasta sauce. Well, that's a bunch of herbs, supplemental herbs. You're not eating basil as a nutrient supply. You're eating as a supplement. You're supplementing it because of the flavor in it. So well, all of but our those, spices, but those, herbs. Herbs, but those herbs and spices have pretty widespread nutritional value too, though. So in a way, you are availing yourself of additional. But that's exactly what most uh, good supplements, herbal supplements, are trying to do: is add a bit of health benefits to that value, like ashwagandha. Although most people don't put ashwagandha on their salad when they eat a salad, uh, they will put rosemary on it. Now, rosemary has a powerful antioxidant prevents uh, oxidative damage because of uh, lipids. I mean, there's a whole host of different, uh, there's some different uh, acids in it that actually help promote healing and help promote health benefits. So if I take rosemary and put it in my pasta sauce, nobody thinks of that as a supplement. But if I take rosemary and put it in a capsule, ugh, it's a supplement, it's bad for you. Well, wait a minute, why is the double standard there? Just because it's in a capsule, it's the exact same herb. Uh, why would you, you like the health benefits of it as a whole food, but a whole food inside a capsule and it's no longer any good for you? That's where I want to get to. I, I taught rebirthing all over the country. Rebirthing is a breath technique that can cause transformational experiences. And all you're doing is breathing deeply, very deeply to, to get a transformational experience. That's using supplemental oxygen. We need oxygen. Uh, our, you know, fifty percent of it is, uh, is used for our brain, uh, so it's required. But when we supplement that oxygen, it really awakens our brain to experiences, deep experiences, even from where it gets its name from, all the way back to birth. Many people can reawaken those experiences by hyperoxygenating the brain. But this is just using simple breath as a supplement, because you're increasing the amount of oxygen beyond normal levels. You know, that's okay. And people see that as okay to gain a transformational experience, has positive health benefits. It's supplemental oxygen. I'm just like, I'm careful about demonizing a whole group of plants that have positive health benefits that could potentially save people from suffering and and dying even and there's plenty of studies to show that like one of the studies on the cactus flower amazing at uh, uh controlling hormones to the point where they did studies in humans 80 percent reduction in the risk of prostate cancer yes you can achieve similar types of effects by going on a strictly whole food diet but how many people 
especially men who are very resistant to change, changing their diet, are going to do that. Now, how much suffering is going to happen because they won't change and they won't take a supplement because supplements are bad for you? No, no, I agree with you. I agree with you. I think the argument, though, is that if you don't move past the idea that cactus flower alone is not going to be the solution, that you haven't really done much for that person because they're still locked into a mindset where they think this isolated nutrition, this isolated nutrient is going to be able to save them from the poor nutrition of an entire whole diet that is moving them in the direction of cancer. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that's where the arguments would come up. But let's let's take that a step further because let's get into one of one of your babies. This is kind of the elephant in the vegan room that's always been playing. And of course, that's in the whole area of omega-3 fatty acids. And, and we've had this discussion and I know this was such an important thing for you that you actually searched the world and found one of the better sources of omega-3 fatty acids and have integrated that in a very conscious way into uh, something that that you share with the public. So let's talk about that whole direction of people feeling compelled to have to go with algal oils and DHA supplementation. Give a little background to your your perception and your story related to that. So my, my passion came as being a compassionate vegan for the animals. The number one animal killed on this planet is sea life, is fish in the ocean. 2.7 trillion fish are killed every year. And over 35% of them are tossed in the garbage. You're talking hundreds of billions of animals killed for zero reason. We've wiped out over 50% of all the life in the ocean and they're about to go extinct. You know, when people say, oh, what's the big deal? We will stop eating fish then. And I said, yeah, you'll be forced to stop eating fish, but that's not the important part. With the collapse of life in the ocean, they eat algae like we were just discussing. That's where they get their omega-3s from. Fish don't produce uh, omega-3s, they eat it just like every other animal. <laughs> and when the fish collapse, the algae over blooms because there's nothing to keep that population in check. And when they do that, they pull all of the oxygen out of the water and then they destroy all of the oxygen in the water and therefore the plant life in the sea collapses. 70% of the oxygen you and I are breathing right now in our own rooms comes from algae. The myth that it comes from forests is, is garbage. It's just not based on that. Actually, the majority of oxygen that is created by forest are taken up by the creatures that live in the forest. They're very actually low producers of oxygen for the global planet. Almost all of it, uh, it comes from the oceans. So we are that close to wiping ourselves out through asphyxiation. Yeah, a few billionaires like Elon Musk will probably live because he'll buy up all the oxygen <laughs> and, and, and do that. But Look, that's what we're teetering on. That's why it was so important. The number one, one of the big reasons is because people assume fish is healthy. Um, it's not. We could go into TMAO, but I wanted to address this plant omegas versus fish because in the supplement industry, fish oil is probably one of the largest besides multivitamins selling supplements. It's a, a multi-billion dollar industry. And it's based on a fallacy that... You know, when I, I always ask in, in all my classes and lectures that I do all around the country, and almost no one gets this correct, I ask them what the two essential fatty acids are for human beings. And almost all of them, 99% will see EFA and DHA. And those are not even essential. They don't even know what the two essential uh, fatty acids are. They're ALA and LA, omega-3 and omega-6. Those are the only ones that humans require because we can't get them, uh, we can't make them from ourselves. Our bodies can take those two and convert it down to all of the other different forms of omega-3 and omega-6. Carnivores have lost the ability to do that. Because they have eaten other animals, they only require EPA and DHA. So uh, those two are actually essential for carnivores. It's clear because we have that mechanism of transference. Our body turns on a gene, produces an enzyme, converts it. Now, the second part of that reason is, well, 
they were saying, wait a minute, ALA doesn't convert very well to EPA and especially even more importantly, DHA. So plants are a bad source of it. Well, that was based on studies measuring the amount of ALA conversion in the bloodstream or even in blood cells. Uh, they thought, oh, that's better. And that was wrong. That's not where the conversion was happening. And we didn't know that until recent studies just within the last two or three years. We now know. So what they did was says, well, let's follow the ALA to see what's happening. Well, uh, and I'll read it right from the, the primary fate of orally administered ALA is beta oxidation, which is the burning of it, use it for calories, and long-term storage in adipose tissue for up to one year. Now, what's it doing sitting in adipose tissue? Well, there's adipose tissue in the brain, so the body is actually storing it there. There's adipose tissue around the liver, which can convert it easily because it's where uh, a lot of enzymes are produced. And there's adipose tissue just about everywhere else in the body, both internally and subcutaneously. So great place to store all this extra ALA. So why would we want to store all that much ALA? Because our body controls and regulates the conversion from ALA to SDA to ETA, then to EPA, then DPA, then DHA, all six forms. And there's very specific reasons for health, for functioning, for usage in, in the structure and function of the cells for each one of those. And the body regulates it by epigenetics, turning on a gene, produce an enzyme, convert it to the next stage. Turn off a gene, it stays there, it won't convert anymore. So this is our body's endogenous way to regulate exactly how much of each one of those is doing. If they store it in the ALA, you can take that dollar bill and change it to quarters or change it to dimes or nickels and pennies when you need a dime or a penny or a nickel. The problem is when we take preformed EPA and DHA, like fish oil or like algae oil, and put it into our body, our body says, well, I didn't make that. I'll start turning off the enzymes because now there's stuff present in way too high a form. Is though, are those ratios important? Yes. It's a nice study, and I'm going to pull it up here because I have the studies in front of me, knowing we were going to get into this um, study that showed, okay, if you have high EPA, this can actually help with somebody with diabetes or diabetes. If you have high blood pressure, high EPA can be damaging. So which is it? Should you have higher EPA to DHA ratio? Yes, if you have diabetes. No, if you have high blood pressure. Well, what if you have both? Now what the body is, is showing us is that the body self-regulates the exact amount for each person, for each gender, for each age group, and for each health condition in each tissue. That's how specific this transformation is happening in real time. And when you dump EPA and DHA and there are big levels in there, you're just throwing that whole balance out of whack. It's just like testosterone. You can take testosterone exogenous, preformed testosterone, put it in the human body, and the body says, whoa, where did all that testosterone come from? I'm going to shut down my own production of it. And if you keep taking that testosterone, you can shut down your testosterone production permanently. Same with thyroid. All these people going on thyroid hormones, same thing. Fortunately, with omega-3s, these genetics can turn back on and back off, like we see with Inuits. The Inuit tribes in Alaska, they have long periods where they can't get plant-based ALA. And their bodies have actually adapted. They added an allele to their genes to help them be able to survive short-term in, in that adaptation by getting their EPA and DHA from fish. Now, Long-term, we know that Inuits actually have a much shorter lifespan because of that. So an adaptive allele will help them survive in the short period, but it's just a, a, a placeholder, a protector, just like, okay, we're hoping you move to a different climate where you're gonna have some plant ALA coming in soon, but it doesn't do this. And over time, they have much shorter lives, often living only to 50, 60 years tops, where you can add 10 years to the life in the general American public, even on a bad diet. 
Well, you see, one of the one of the things that has made that confusing is that when they started doing omega index tests, where they were looking at the amount of EPA and DHA in the membrane of red blood cells, yes. and they and used that calculation as to what percentage of all the fatty acids in that membrane are made up of EPA and DHA, they started seeing that when the numbers went up in those blood cell membranes, they had correlative studies that would show extension of lifespan, reduction of heart disease. In Japan, when that number gets eight and above, they live about five years longer than people when it's less than five. So it made it very confusing because it made it look like the endpoint accumulation of those parts of the omega-3 family when they built up in the membrane of blood cells, it seemed to be linked directly with longevity and, 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 and a decrease in mortality and morbidity. But as you're presenting it, so I can summarize it, because I'm sure some of our, our, our viewers are sitting there shaking their heads. The fact <laughs> of the matter is, while ALA converts very poorly to DHA, the ability of the body to store it long term in fat cells and in liver and even in brain tissue allows the body to release that as it needs it over time under the demands of neurological development, whatever the case may be. So just looking at it as an endpoint supplement does, does a disservice to the dynamic that we've now started to recognize in the body's ability to kind of decipher and, and dictate how it will release these long-term stores for its body needs. And so that, I think people need to look at that because our, historically, that's all we did. You know, you get a study that says, well, you need EPA and DHA, so let's just load it up. And you made the point that you always have, in science, we call that end product inhibition. Mm -hmm. That when you ever have a pathway, whatever you're producing, if you provide that, it blocks that pathway from operating to produce it on its own. And so this is very important. And and I think these data, looking at storage and release, and, you know, will, I think as the time progresses, it'll flesh out the picture that right now is being limited to just red blood cell membranes. And I think I, I agree with you. That's not really talking about real tissue availability. Um, let's shift gears. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, we're here with Jeff Palmer, the CEO and founder of Clean Machine. And uh, Jeff, where can people uh, find you? How can they follow you? How can they find you? Give us a, uh, a website address where they can find you. Yeah, so you can find the products on cleanmachineonline.com. Uh, you can find me on Facebook at Jeff Palmer, and it's G-E-O-F-F -F Palmer, uh, spelled the British way. Um, and you can also follow us on uh, social at Clean Machine Fit at um, at uh, IG, uh, Instagram, and Facebook. I do weekly Facebook Lives covering all the latest research that comes out. So I scour, scour all the latest research uh, and and try to bring that to the public um, and uh, you know kind of comb through it, like the DHA study that just recently came out that showed. They measured it, and their estimates were about 20 to 50 grams of stored DHA in the fat, liver, and the brain tissues. So it, the, they estimated that the brain's need is 2.4 milligrams. So that would equate to 22 years worth of stored DHA in the brain. Now, why would the body do that? It's because the body is saying, I'm going to hang on to this whenever you get it into your food supply. So sometimes we'd have good feast and sometimes we'd have famine. This will help the body keep homeostasis, keep a ready, usable supply for the brain. Now, to your point, there are many studies out there that show, hey, this person took DHA and had health benefits from it immediate. Well, yes, but were they deficient in it? Were they eating other things that were inhibiting it? Were they doing other things that were circumventing the process? A great study came out on vegans and found that they looked at vegans. This was um, the Norfolk, Epic Norfolk study. And um, they found that vegans, once you change to a plant exclusive diet, now only when that happens does something epigenetically change. They found that those with a plant exclusive diet for a, a period of time, not just short, short weeks or months, but a period of time, were producing 
lots more of the enzyme that converted it. So that is telling me, hey, I, I don't have an enzyme. An interesting study on animals, and please, I do not condone animal studies or testing, but I'm not going to deny the information. They took animals and depleted DHA from their diet, and then they measured their bloodstream. Their DHA levels went up. If they're not getting it from their diet, where is it coming from? It's the stored DHA trying to supercompensate for the lack of it coming into the diet, entering into the bloodstream. They even gave ALA exclusively to the animal for its entire life. And those rats and mice wrote and study. So it is what it is. We're, they're not humans, but only ALA. And they measured the DHA and it was no different than those given DHA. No different whatsoever. It's how long you do something, do you become more and more efficient at it? So the longer you are a plant exclusive, the more your body is going to adapt and become more efficient at utilizing that source of nutrition. Well, Jeff, let's shift gears with something that I know is near and dear to your heart. And that, of course, is competitive bodybuilding from a vegan mm -hmm. standpoint. And I know that you've got a conference coming up, one of the bodybuilding exhibitions in Fort Lauderdale. So give me, talk a little bit about that, but also how you got into bodybuilding, how you have such a passion for these athletes and how you've played a major role in trying to be there for the education of staying plant exclusive when you're involved in competitive bodybuilding. Talk about that a little bit, please. Yeah, so I, I was a, a competitive swimmer in high school and college, a junior Olympic swimmer, and I quickly realized eating five to 8,000 calories a day and still being around 6% body fat, uh, what impact uh, exercise has on the bo body as well as what diet can influence the body. So I saw very early, you know, the relationship there. Um, and so when I was at a veg fest, I, I got into working out and loved it. I love the way it feels. I love the way I just carried myself with better confidence. Uh, I slept better. I was less depression, all of the good things that come from this exercise. But so I loved working out uh, with resistance training. I was at a bench fest and a woman came up to me and she said, she saw my vegan t-shirt and she says, my boyfriend says you don't exist. <laughs> and she goes, how do you get 17 inch arms like that on a vegan diet? He says it's impossible. And when I heard that, I realized there's this huge men, meat and masculinity myth that it is so entrenched in our society that you have to get meat from pro your protein from meat for whatever reason. It's just it's just an absolute fallacy. But they bought it. It's it's a religion. It's a dogma. It's a, it's a mindset that they don't even believe it. She goes, can I take a picture of you? Because he's not going to believe. And when at that time I told her I was almost 40 and she's like, oh, no, no. Show me your driver's license. She didn't believe that even. So, you know, here I am. I uh, put it up there. It's 60 years of age this month. Uh, best out of my life. I'm physically active every single day. I love life. And to have that much energy and that experience, I want to be a living example of what can be accomplished after 38 years of eating nothing but plants, exercising every day, and living to 60 years old, completely drug-free, and, and being in the best shape of my life. I'm in the gym on a daily basis, and People don't believe I'm 60. People don't believe I can bench 445 pounds at 60 years of age as a 38-year vegan. That's why I share those videos. I want to be living evidence of what can be accomplished without drugs, without any health conditions at 60 years of age on a completely plant-based diet. So I said, let's take this further, not just me being an example. I created the first and only completely drug-free vegan bodybuilding competition in the world. And now we're going to have 50 to 100 completely natural drug-free vegans taking the stage, doing a live feed for the whole nation to see what all of these individuals can accomplish without drugs, only on plants. And I think it's a powerful message. No and especially my heart goes out to the men. Men are dying at a much higher rate 
from their lifestyle and diet choices. And it's sad when I see these people, great study just came out, was so disheartening to me. At the age of 35, most Americans, 54% of Americans already have at least one disease state at 35. This is, this is tragic. I'm 60 and I've never had a disease state. It doesn't have to be that way. People think that's normal. That's become the new normal to be sick. By the time they're 60, 14 medications on average for the United States. That's the statistic. That's horrible. And it doesn't have to be that way. I'm, I'm trying to show the example of what can be accomplished to inspire people, but also to give them a base in reality that, wait a minute, I'm being lied to. They told me I have to eat that food. They told me I have to take that medication. I have to go to that hospital. I have to see that doctor. That's the only path of trust. And I'm like, no, it doesn't. There are good doctors out there like you who can steer people in a better direction. That's my passion. I, I'm doing a whole book on meat men and the masculinity myth because it's it's destroying men's lives and they're still withholding to the very thing that's destroying their lives. It's so important. Jeff, as we wrap this up, do you have any final words you'd like to share with the audience out here? Well, just like, and, and I totally uh, can understand your take on supplements. It should never be a, supple, uh, a substitute for proper health and always health first. And um, I, I, I totally get that. I think that there is stepping stones needed. Like within the movement, you see people saying, oh, Kentucky Fried Chicken has now vegan nuggets. I actually applaud that. Do I want everybody eating fried chicken nuggets? Oh, hell no. <laughs> you know, but if that's a stepping stone to move away from the animal products, to move away from causing all the suffering to the animals, to move away from the detrimental impact that the animal industry has on our environment, and to move, yes, to a better, eating a real chicken nugget versus a vegan chicken nugget, is it's good, better, best. <laughs> Would I love to see everybody go straight to a no oil, no salt, whole food, plant-based diet? Yeah, it's just not going to happen. We're, you know, I've been vegan for 38 years and we're still at what, five or 6% of the population <laughs> is vegan. So I realize that people need stepping stones and I want to give them the stepping stones even when it's not ideal. So I agree. I wish everybody would go straight to whole food and, and and whole plant foods, organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, the whole works. I would love to see that. It's not a reality. And I want to try to help the most people possible by at least giving them stepping stones to a better path and hoping that those improvements will keep inspiring them to keep moving forward. Jeff, I want to really thank you for taking the time today to share your information, your insight, your heart. And I encourage our audience to follow Jeff. Um, his location will be in our show notes. We'll make sure that you have those. I especially want to thank our audience uh, for being part of this with us. Without you, I couldn't do what I do. We couldn't do what we do. I want to thank you for being part of this active community on behalf of the National Health Association. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I really look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Health Science Podcast. You've been listening to the Health Science Podcast brought to you by the National Health Association. Thank you for joining us today and for your commitment to evidence-based health science that backs a whole food plant exclusive lifestyle and contributes to the well-being of all people, animals, and our environment. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. Be sure to leave a rating and a review and we'll see you on the next show.